I plan each charted course, each careful step along the byway, and more, much more than this. I did it my way. There's no that uncompromising, enterprising, anything but tranquilizing. Right, right on, on. on. I mean, we are poor. And if you was to make a list of all the things that people want to be, poor would be right down at the bottom of the list. Just about sick and dead. <laughs> Imagine an English neighbor. Good God, you're black. <laughs> My name's Stivic, Joey Stivic. I'm Bond, James Bond. Warning, the program you are about to see is all in the family. It seeks to throw a humorous spotlight on our frailties, prejudices, and concerns. By making them a source of laughter, we hope to show in a mature fashion just how absurd they are. This is Rob Reiner. I'm here to sing God Bless Norman Lear. The kid from New Haven, Connecticut, grew up to inspire Patty Chayefsky to say, Norman Lear took television away from dopey wives and dumb fathers, from the pimps, hookers, hustlers, private eyes, junkies, cowboys and rustlers that constituted television chaos, and in their place, he put the American people. Might I add, warts and all. Let's go back to the night my former boss was honored by his fellow writers. For his 40 years of writing television that has made us laugh and think, the Patty Chayefsky TV Laurel Award goes to Norman Lear. Thank you. I must say that no one enjoyed watching those pieces more than I did, and no one, no one has ever enjoyed them more than I. And I've seen them all dozens of times. But I have the additional pleasure of looking at those wonderful moments and recalling the shared laughs of their creation. You know, it is, it's one thing to look at a fully executed piece of hilarity and quite another to recall at the same moment its creation. Then the working and the reworking, the anticipatory excitement of the first reading, the joy of hearing great actors mouth the words, the excitement of preparing to see the moment on its feet for the first time and run through. Then in the dress rehearsal, finally the arrival of that night and the audience, the cast shot full of the adrenaline of a live performance and then the orgasm of that performance, and the laughs, the laughs, the laughs. And so, I want to say to all of the Schillers, and Weisskopfs, and Parkers, and Hauks, and Kalishes, and Marcuses, and Moys, and Moriarty's, and Josephsburgs, and Lachmans, and Tolkens, and Rhines, and all the other glorious writing talents that graced my life in working collaboration, all those with whom I split my sides, I busted a gut, I wet my pants, I laughed my ass off. <laughs> to you, dearest, 
Darling collaborators, I have laughed so hard with each of you, enjoyed so much your company, and grown so much rubbing against your hearts and souls and talents. I have no doubt that the experience has added time to my life. So if the chip that held my fate at birth called for me to pass on, let's say, at 50, you are all a good part of the reason why I stand here at 70. And because I'm not through yet, despite the tens of network executives who think old age begins at 40, I will continue to write with others among you and thank you for helping me laugh all the way to 90. Thank you. The Writers Guild Foundation finally managed to nail Norman down for this interview, where again I got the chance to thank him for helping me get out of television. Norman, let, let's go back to the days when you were poor but honest and in the United States Armed Forces. Uh, what was your greatest ambition then besides saving the world for democracy? Well, when I, uh, when, uh, I was getting out of the Army, I wanted to be a publicist uh, because I had one uncle on both sides of my family that could uh, afford to flick a, a nephew a quarter. Every time I saw my Uncle Jack, he had a quarter for me. And uh, he was a publicist. Didn't know what that meant. But I knew I wanted to be what Uncle Jack was because I wanted to be an uncle who could flick a quarter to a nephew. So when I was overseas, I uh, contacted, uh, and I was about to be mustered out, I contacted Jack and he sent me the names of a half a dozen Broadway press houses. Uh, and I wrote all of them and received job offers oh, from over in Foggia, Italy, as my tour of duty ended, from two of them. I took one, and that's how, and I, and I was there for about, uh, about eight, ten months, and we were pregnant. I went in for a $5 raise from 40 to $45 at a time when George Ross was the name of the uh, house told me that he was thinking of asking me to come down to uh, 30 because uh, these were not good times. You know, we sat around in a uh, uh, in little office, a little cubicle I had in New York writing columns, full columns for Walter Winchell, for uh, Dorothy Kilgallen, uh, in exchange for which they would put Ross's clients uh, in the paper. When did you start to earn an honest living? Well, I came out to California, uh, again, to, to seek work uh, in publicity out here. And my wife uh, and another woman, uh, who happened to be my first cousin, uh, became very good friends. And uh, her husband, Ed Simmons, wanted to be a comedy writer. So uh, the girls were out uh, to a movie one evening. And, uh, and we wrote something together. He asked me if I wanted to help him write something. So we wrote a parody, I think, to the Sheik of Araby. But the women came home after the movie at 10 o'clock or so. And in those days, there were many uh, nightclubs in Los Angeles, the Bar of Music and uh, uh, Eddie Foy's Supper Club and so forth. So uh, we went out with this parody we'd written and sold it for $40. Now, that was better than half of what I made selling baby pictures door to door with Simmons. And so we started to write every night together and, uh, and then would go out and try to sell them to comics working in different clubs. We had a little office uh, above a delicatessen on uh, Beverly Boulevard and, uh, and Simmons and I would write there in the evenings, five dollars a month, and we would write there in the evenings. And, uh, uh, one day I had a thought for something that Danny Thomas would do. I loved Thomas. I loved the way he, the raconteur in Thomas, told these endless stories and held an audience by the nape uh, and then in the last moment let him go. And so I had a thought for uh, Danny Thomas and uh, we knew he was represented from the trades. We knew he was represented by the William Morris office. I recall calling uh, somebody at the Morris office and got a secretary who's, uh, for who worked for, working for the agent that handled Thomas, Phil Kellogg, I think. And uh, 
talking a mile a minute. And I said, uh, my name was Merle Robinson, a name I used in these contexts. Uh, my name was Merle Robinson. I was with the uh, New York Times. I had been out here for two days doing a story on uh, Danny Thomas. I have two questions I had forgotten to ask him. I must ask him before I get on the plane. Whoop, they're calling my plane. <laughs> Uh, I have two questions. I'm going to write it on the plane and file it when I get And she gave me his number. Yeah, yeah. So I called Thomas and, uh, and said, uh, my partner and I had a thought, uh, had a, uh, a routine for him. And he said he was, uh, he picked up the phone. He was working with Wally Pop, his uh, accompanist. And they, the next night, were doing, a, were doing something at Ciro's. Yeah. Uh, for the industry, some industry, the Lambs Club or something. And, uh, and they knew every routine he had, and he was looking for something fresh and new, uh, short. And he said, how long is your piece? I said, oh, about five minutes. He said, well, get over here right away. And, uh, and I said, well, we'll take about three hours. <laughs> he said, but you said you were in Hollywood. I'm in Beverly Hills. But we hadn't written this thing yet. So... Uh, we wrote it, got over there in less than three hours, and he bought it. But, and four days later, uh, we were in New York uh, at the Wellington Hotel, thrown in a room under lock and key, and told to write two sketches for Jack Haley for the Ford Star Review. Ed Simmons and I uh, got a call from uh, Martin and Lewis, having seen a sketch we wrote on the Ford Star Review. and. Uh, we went over to the Colgate Comedy Hour and we're bringing them on to television for the first time. We did one show. Uh, I don't know if anyone remembers that Martin and Lewis did, uh, did uh, radio. We did it. I mean, it was amazing, amazing experience. I, radio, uh, radio allowed us to do things like we did a uh, streetcar named Desire with Dinah Shore. She played... Uh, uh, Blanche? Blanche. And Jerry played the streetcar. Now, you can't do that <laughs> anywhere else but radio. We had a wonderful time doing radio. And then we were moving west because the transcontinental cable had been laid. Uh, and the night before, we were all traveling west to start doing our shows from, from Los Angeles. Uh, there was a party, a farewell party at Bud Yorkin's. And a great many of the uh, uh, NBC people, it was an NBC show, were there. Pat Weaver was there, and Sam Fuller, and Pete Barnum, names I hope some people will recognize looking at this <laughs> tape someday. Uh, and Bud York and John Rich, Jack Smite, and uh, Arthur Penn were the four stage managers, right. all there. We st uh, uh, Sam Fuller played the piano, and we stood around the piano, and... Uh, in a sense, this is indicative of the camaraderie and the fun and the joy of doing television in those years, as opposed to the grimness of, uh, yes. of the in industry, the mean-spiritedness of the industry today. Uh, we sat around, stood around the piano, and we wrote this parody. When the transcontinental coaxial cable is laid, is laid, when the transcontinental coaxial cable is laid, we're made. There'll be no more great kinescopes. We'll be there with our kinefolks. You'll hear those kookamonga jokes coming to you. From Hollywood and Vine Street, we'll be on the run <coughs> to the land of sun and swimming pools. The dramatic shows will be static shows if they stay. Those fools... Hortrachornia, it's California. We'll ride the super chief when the transcontinental coaxial cable is laid. Thank you, Jerry Vale. I would add uh, lots of applause there, a cheering audience, standing right. ovation. Anything you say, boss. How about today? Are, are there a lot of young writers like you and Ed Simmons coming to you with material? Yeah, I, uh, wherever I go, somebody's standing with an envelope. Ever open one? Uh, an idea. The phone rings constantly. With I mean, we have several people in the office who uh, spend a great deal of time looking at new material. I don't like to leave anything unread. Yeah. I like to get back to everybody. Yeah. And uh, so 
Television is one of those mediums, comes into the home, people everywhere look at it and think, uh, I, I can do that. Sure. Well, my life is as interesting as that, or I've lived through something as dramatic or comedic as that. Yeah. Uh, so the world feels it can write television. And sometimes television looks it. What was the difference when you worked alone? Larry Gelbart used to say, I work alone because I get all the money. But was there a creative difference? Well, when Simmons and I worked together, uh, it was very much the same as working alone because I could never write with anybody. Yeah. We never wrote together. Yeah. We discussed uh, the arc of a, uh, of a piece, uh, and then I would take one uh, act, he would take another act if it was the book musicals, or yeah. he would do one sketch, I would do another, we would rewrite each other. But I've never been able to write, uh, I can sit at the table In the same after a run-through, uh, and rewrite with a, with a group, but I can't sit down and, and, and do an original piece. Was it much of a change moving from live to tape? Well, my, uh, my move from live to tape also moved from sketch comedy to story right. comedy. Right. So I moved from, from variety theater yeah. to, uh, to uh, the one-act play. Yeah. That's the way I always looked at it. The reason I wanted to do it on tape <clears throat> when I started with All in the Family, which was the first show, I wanted to do it. I begged the network, this is the one fight I lost, to do it in black and white because I, I just felt it would be grittier and more real. And, uh, uh, but we, we, I always thought we were doing one-act plays. And if you look at those pieces, virtually all the shows, they were done in real time. 90% of our stories were stories that you know, began and ended. Uh, a half hour with, was a with half a, hour. A half hour was a half hour, and, and, and we were not, uh, well, or we might skip uh, a, yeah. a days or, or hours uh, in between acts, yeah. but we weren't stopping every two pages yeah. uh, for another scene. Yeah. We were doing it like a, th like a theater piece one, with, with one intermission. How did All in the Family get its start? Well, I was, uh, I, All in the Family came into my life when I read about a show that was done in England yes. called Till Death Us Do Part. And I read about a father and son, or father and son-in-law, uh, who were fighting about all the great conservative and liberal fighting about the issues that were uh, troubling some in, in England at that time. And I went, my God, how could I not have thought about this? I grew up in a house with a father who, he used to call me the laziest white kid he ever met. And I would scream at him, Dad, how do you put down a whole race of people that call me lazy? And he'd say, it's not what I'm doing, and you are the dumbest white kid I met. I grew up with this guy. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I read this piece and said, my God, I've got to do it, and started to work on it. Yeah. Uh, and what we did was very, very much different from the uh, 18 or so episodes that comprised the life of Till Death Us Do Part in England. Uh, you know, I remember people, I remember the press and so forth uh, picking on us because uh, we were sending messages. Just, you know, don't, uh, you have no right to send messages. And I used to think and say, uh, I couldn't see a message that we had ever sent that was as all-inclusive as wall-to-wall -wall and floor-to-ceiling and definite as the messages of uh, all of those shows out of the 60s, which never dealt with anything but a white society. The biggest problem was uh, Mother Dented the Fender and how are we going to uh, you know, prepare Dad for this, or the boss is coming to dinner and the meatloaf is ruined, or, uh, which suggested that there were no race problems in America, there were no drug problems in America, fathers and sons and mothers and daughters got along brilliantly in America. There was no family angst. There was no problem. There were no problems. And no illness. Uh, that's, you know, that is a message for an entire decade. So when we would do shows that had to do with cancer or, uh, or menopause or, or whatever, hardly seemed so strong a message as what preceded. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. I got a lump in my breast. What did you just say? I got a lump oh, in my breast. That's 
the first time I said it out loud. I'm afraid if I have this operation, Archie won't think of me in the same way. Oh, Edith, stop scaring yourself. Archie loves you and nothing's gonna change that. But I'm gonna change a lot. Listen, even if you have to have the operation, it's still gonna be all right. Believe me. You don't know. That's just the point, Edith. I do know. I know. You mean you? Six years ago. And you see how Frank and I get along? It hasn't made one bit of difference in our marriage. Don't bother looking, Edith. <laughs> I, I wasn't. <laughs> you can't tell, and there's no use asking me. Oh, no, I wouldn't think of asking. I mean, I think of it, but I wouldn't ask. <laughs> oh, Irene, you made me feel so much better. Oh. Do you think that kind of honesty helped bring on today's attacks on the entertainment industry? I think, I think so much of the attack on television and film uh, is an unconscious red herring. By unconscious, I mean I don't think this is deliberate, but they're not looking to the real problems in our culture from which uh, the excesses occur. I remember one episode where you brought sex down to earth and to Edith. Just stay quiet, okay? What are you gonna do? You ain't taking off your clothes, are you? <laughs> yeah. Then I'm gonna take yours off. Wouldn't you like a cup of coffee? <laughs> I don't drink coffee. I got Sanka. <laughs> The lady is falling and it ain't gonna do you any good. And this is gonna happen. So just relax, okay? Oh, listen, I gotta get out of here. See, I gotta get ready for my birthday party. Happy birthday. Oh, oh thank you. Really now, wait a minute. What? Couldn't we do this without kissing? Yeah, yeah, okay. But you're gonna change your mind. Oh, there's something burning in the kitchen. What is it? It's in the kitchen. All right, all right, come on, come on, come on. There's something burning in the kitchen. Oh, oh there's a fire! Fire! But... Oh, my birthday cake! <coughs> my birthday cake is burning! Lady, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. But we live in a culture that's full of excess. And it's to, to, to uh, land-based television and look for it there and concentrate on, on those excesses, overlooking, for example, uh, we live at a time when, uh, and we're coming into a new national election, when uh, candidates running for office on the local level, the city, the state, the national level, spend 100 percent of their money in television uh, diminishing destroying seeking to diminish and destroy the other candidate at any cost but, you know uh, and this violence that's w also wall-to-wall -wall, floor to ceiling the kids cannot grow up in our culture having any heroes in in uh, in, in the area of civic responsibility if I could change one area of excessive violence in the, in the uh, media, it would be the way the local news is handled all across the country. If there are four stories that have to do, deal, that, that deal with murders and beatings and rapes, and, or even if they're last weeks, they'll be at the top of the news. Uh, and some of the most important things that are going on in the culture and in the world are relegated to later stories 
on, on the half hour news. So, I mean, there are problems so deep and profound in our society that, uh, that get overlooked while uh, they pick up uh, the, the headlines criticizing television and, uh, and film. The uh, programmers, television programmers, are in a box. They're in the same box that, the, uh, that I see businesses in everywhere else in the country. The name of the game in American business for some years, and escalatingly so, has been give me a profit statement this quarter larger than the last, and every other value be damned. That's true as, as, as corporate America reports to Wall Street across the board. In television, you see it when programmers say, you know, uh, view this most important, a hit Tuesday night at 8.30 and every other value be damned. If that's the way you're running a network and Friends uh, is a big smash, then you witness on the other networks five or seven clones of, of uh, friends. And we have seen this every year in the 45 or so years I've been around the medium. Uh, there's nothing left for them to do but, do, but try to copy what's successful because they have to have a hit uh, quickly. Now, when I get into television, uh, in my generation, the network bought 39 shows and didn't do repeats, the word didn't exist in this context, they did summer replacements. So in the 13 weeks of summer replacement, they tried new talent, new writing, they, they explored and innovated. Uh, and then came tape. Then they found out that an audience would take 13 of the best episodes after a 39-week series and they could repeat them. Well, if they can repeat them and do well for the bottom line, then for 13, let's try 26. We'll split up the year. 26 new shows, 26 repeats. Uh, when All in the Family went on, it was a little later in the cycle, they were buying 13 episodes. Thank God we went on in January. If we hadn't gone on in January, we would, you would never have seen the 14th episode of All in the Family. But in January, ending in May, uh, we had we had a couple of shows on the air after the the uh, first run shows on the other two networks, there were only three networks also at that time, were ended. So we had two shows in the clear, no competition on the other two networks. In the early days, didn't the advertisers call the shots? When, when, uh, when uh, advertisers ruled the roost, uh, my first job uh, was, to, was working for, uh, for J. Walter Thompson because they, uh, they were the ones producing the Martha Ray shows. And uh, not my first job, but, but uh, first job of that kind. And uh, I mean, they had, they had their own rules and their own laws and so forth. I, I'll never forget, and it probably is what put the, Ma the Martha Ray show away ultimately. Ended it much uh, earlier in its life than it should have ended. We had it, we did a show uh, with a little girl, a little black girl who had won the $64,000 question. She was about 9 or 10 or 11. And uh, Tulila Bankhead was on the show and Martha and somebody else. And in the bows, and this child was just, you know, angelic in this show, and in the bows, uh, Tulula and Martha and another woman, another white actress, and this little black girl. And Tulula picked the child up and kissed her. And Martha joined in the kiss, and then the other person did too. And that resulted in, you know, whether it's 12 letters or 112 letters, I don't know. But it was enough to destroy the, uh, the, the uh, company's confidence in, in the show. And it was hell from then on. Hell from then on. And ultimately the show ended. And years later, you did the Jeffersons. Any earlier, you might have been lynched. We have to fight so much. If we have a problem, why can't we just talk it through? Like Tom and Helen, they don't fight. They don't fight because they're scared to fight. What's that supposed to mean? You know damn well what it means. If you two ever really started going at one another, inside of five minutes, he'd be calling you... Don't say it. Nigger. He said it. <laughs> when All in the Family came along, then you, as you might expect, 
uh, I heard a great deal from them. Yeah. They, uh, they, after having made the pilot episode for CB, I had made it three years before with the same actors and couldn't sell it. They, everybody laughed at it, but, uh, yeah. but didn't want to put it on. When, when, uh, when CBS finally, in the person of Bob Wood, said, let's do this, he wanted me to do a different script. And I said, no, this script was calculated to show you 360 degrees of Archie Bunker. Sure. Uh, we're going to jump into the water. You can't get wetter than wet. And we're going to get all wet on this show, and then we know where we are with the American people. Uh, so we made it. But even after we made it, we had made two other shows or four other shows before we were to go on the air. The big fight was to put the show we made second on first. Let that be the show that was reviewed and broke the ice and so forth. And it wasn't until the night before the airing of the show that I could call my wife. In, in those years, we were working late. Uh, and say it was close to midnight, it was 3 o'clock in the morning in New York, <clears throat> and say they're going to put the first show on. Uh, I remember feeling that we were doing something special, and I just couldn't believe that they were letting us stay on the air, and I think pretty much everybody had that feeling. They felt they were in a very funny piece, and it was real, yeah. and everybody had lived it, everybody knew the people, <clears throat> and they felt great about doing something that was as real and honest as that, in a medium that wasn't always... <clears throat> as uh, as honest, yeah. but no, nobody felt like they were heroes, or sure. you know, maybe we were even a little afraid, you know, because we'd heard so much from the networks about, uh, you know, the states were going to secede from the union. Yeah. <laughs> Would any network schedule that show today? Well, you know, people ask all the time: Would uh, could all in the family, if it came about today, uh, get on? And I don't know the answer to the question. Uh, I, 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 the second half I can answer, I'm sure, if it got on and it had never been on but got on now, the public would take to it because there was uh, magic in, that chem in the uh, chemistry of those actors. They were brilliant in the roles and they were hilariously funny. Maria, would you like to sit down? Oh, no, I'm too nervous to sit down. Well, then maybe I'll sit down. <laughs> I think it's time that you and me had a woman-to-woman -woman talk about... about... <laughs> the wedding night? Yeah, about that. <laughs> okay, Ma. if you don't want to. I mean, I know how hard it is for you to talk about these things. How did you know that? I guess because you never talk about them. You, you don't have to be embarrassed, Ma. Oh, thank you, Gloria. I know you just want me to be very happy. I do. A and tonight, Michael and I... We'll be nervous. Yeah. Because <laughs> we're both really strangers to one another. That's right. A and the important thing to remember is that we love and respect each other. And above all, that we treat each other with patience and tenderness tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Ma, I'm glad we had this little talk. <laughs> oh, Gloria, I never thought I'd be able to say it all to you. Oh, Ma. <laughs> what would they pick up today? I, I can, I, I, I've only been able to go with my own slide rule. If I think it's funny and terrific, I think you're going to think it's funny and terrific. So that's not the way television, and that's the way more writers and producers used to think. But now the research 
is so demanding. Those numbers, 18 to 49, and uh, kids, and uh, <clears throat> I, I, I don't get caught up in that, which is probably why I'm not on the air today. But I wouldn't know how. I wouldn't know how. I gotta, I've got to go with my own slide rule. I think too much of television, writers are doing it because this is what they'll buy, not because they're passionate about it, but this is what they'll buy. Also, there was, when, when we were doing the shows, our objection was to bring an audience to its knees. We weren't seeking to be tim timidly funny or, you know, uh, looking for small laughs. We wanted them to their knees, uh, whether they were crying or laughing or both. You know, we wanted to do it with the story. We wanted to do it with the jokes. We wanted to do it with the... We wanted to br bring them down. It'll be all right, Maud, you'll see. Just a minute, Arthur. Hello, lover boy. Was Vivian wearing saran wrap under that <laughs> Fred Allen once said that imitation is the sincerest form of television. Is that still true? They have to have that hit Tuesday night at 8.30. <clears throat> Nothing else matters so much. And as a consequence, the nature of that hit, the quality of that hit, is far less significant than the fact of it. There's no pride. The word broadcaster was something the old... Uh, you know, Paley's and, and uh, Stanton's and uh, Goldensons and so forth cared about. Yeah. Be a broadcaster doesn't imply any extra responsibility or any reason for special pride, not unless you're winning. I, I love the way HBO can do what they want, language-wise. Yeah. But if you pay close attention to HBO, they're doing the brighter subjects, the more intelligent subjects, the, uh, they are tackling the greater issues. And, uh, and yes, they're franker about the language, but that's not what's significant. What's significant is, you know, they dare with a show like Larry, Shand uh, Larry Shandling to, uh, to be bitterly satirical. Do you think television is reflecting society or is society reflecting television? God help us. <clears throat> I think television, I think uh, television both leads and follows society. Uh, it doesn't invent much that's new. It picks up on something. What it does, by way, in, in terms of its excess, is then it stimulates what it picks up that's already there in society and carries it great distances. So it seems to be leading. Uh, what's happened to the American family is far more profound than how it's depicted on television. The fact of life as I see it in America is that the compact that existed for a great many years with the, with the, the economy and, and corporate America of the average American family <clears throat> has been broken entirely with companies that have gone offshore, with companies that have you know, now these enormous layoffs, with companies that existed in towns for 80 years and suddenly are gone, vanished. Uh, you know, people grew up in this country understanding that if they couldn't get out of the little town to become an accountant or a, or, or a, uh, a doctor or a dentist or something, they were going to go to work where their fathers worked, where their uncles worked, where their grandfathers worked. All of that's shattered. The fabric of society having nothing to do with television, uh, except as it's exacerbated by seeing it reflected on television. Uh, is is shattering, and uh, I think these young people talking about having a good time are far more motivated by a lack of interest in doing anything more important than hanging around, because they don't see it working for anybody. They don't see it working for families. Uh, they don't see relationships holding the way the relationships held, and they see no 
respect for moral authority and civil authority anywhere, anywhere. Should television take all the blame? Well, yes, I think there's a responsibility to, uh, to help the American people reach for something better. It's, I, mean, I think there's a great responsibility there, but there's also a responsibility for people who manufacture breakfast cereals to tell the truth about the amount of sugar in them. I mean, this is a culture that's run by the bottom line. You know, in, at the beginning of television, uh, Sinoff uh, supported a uh, symphony orchestra on NBC with one of the great conductors of our time. Uh, these things happened at a time when there was far less demand for a profit statement this quarter. I'm repeating, I know, but, but that's so much of everything that's going on is dictated by that common ethic. What about movies? You made Divorce American Style and Cold Turkey. Were you doing them because they faced social issues? No, I, I wouldn't do anything because it was a, a terrific social issue if I didn't think I had a way of doing it in a vastly entertaining way. The, the, uh, the first uh, responsibility, because that's the initial promise, is come to my theater, turn on my television, your television, look at my show, because it will entertain you. I mean, that's the primary responsibility. So if it isn't going to be entertaining, uh, it, it doesn't work. Then secondarily, you know, I'm a grown-up. I, I care about my culture, so I, I gravitate to things that are meaningful to me, but not if they're not entertaining. The domestic scenes in Divorce American Style were, in many cases, scenes I absolutely lived. My parents fought like wild like that. That was right out of my life. And, uh, and we lived in a one-room apartment, two-room apartment. Uh, and I used to be, so the fights took place much like the honeymooners around a kitchen table. But I would sit at the kitchen table scoring the fight. That was the way I yes. got through it. And uh, in the film, they were fighting in the kitchen and the camera panned up to a transom and then dissolved through to an equal, a transom in the bedroom and then came down to a kid in bed, also with a clipboard scoring. Did you have an outline before you started? I don't think I've started to write without having some understanding of where it was going to wind up. Uh, some sense of a three-act progression, which I may not have worked out thoroughly. Before, I, I think more often than not I need that before I, I actually start. Also, uh, about 35 years ago, uh, I, I was one of these writers who, uh, who was sitting over a first paragraph or an opening speech for a day and a half, you know, before I could get past it. And, uh, and then coming back to it because it was sitting there all the time. And uh, two things, I, I fell on somebody's couch once who gave me two wonderful pieces of advice. The first piece of advice was, uh, get yourself a tape recorder. Talk into a tape recorder. Don't finish it before you look at a word and you won't get trapped and you will be surprised how much you like when you finish it. Talk, just talk into it. So I've been, I've been using a tape recorder and I can't get to a computer. I, I work a computer, but I don't do word processing because I'm so used to dictating. I, I just can't. My mind and my fingers don't work together any longer. The second piece of advice was I would, I, I would be trying to dictate and still saying, <laughs> I, but I, I, I'm doing the first thing again and again. Or I, I, ha I can't get started. I don't know where to get started. And this wonderful piece of advice, he said, uh, he said, think of a, a room with 40 people in it and somebody yelling fire, one, ex one exit. Everybody runs to one narrow exit and nobody gets out. But if everybody got out one, two at a time, they'd all get out before you know, they were suffocated. Think about ideas in your head the same way. Let them out. It doesn't matter what the order is. They'll sort themselves out on the other side of the door. Just get them out before they suffocate. With the tape recorder, do you play all the parts? All the parts. They're an entertainment. <laughs> Did you play a dual role in Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman? That show was brilliant. What about the episode with Dabney Coleman? Dabney Coleman played the father of a nine-year-old or a seven-year-old, I forget, evangelist. Uh, and the kid uh, drowned in his bathtub 
when a uh, when a television said he was watching the seven o'clock news, fell into the and he was electrocuted and uh, not drowned. He was electrocuted in the bathtub uh, by the seven o'clock news. And <laughs> oh, we had. And then there is this glorious moment where Mary Hartman has had a breakdown and is in a uh, in an institution, and uh, there's a television set there. And she... um, what is it, what is that uh, little black box on the side of the TV? Oh, I'm pleased you noticed that so quickly. You certainly are regaining your awareness. Oh well, I, it's just that I've never seen one of those before. Oh, well, I don't imagine you have that little black box as a telemeter. That's a telemeter. What is this, a pay TV? Oh, no, no, no. You can't buy that. You have to be chosen. A telemeter measures ratings. Ratings? Oh, don't tell me. Are we? Oh, we're not. Are we? Yes, Mary. We are. I can't believe it. All of us? Everyone here, Mary, yes. Including me now? That's right. Believe it, that I, Mary Hartman, am finally a member of the Nielsen family. With all these people come around, all the inmates of this institution come around to look at the set, as they all learn at the same time that they are a Nielsen family. How did you find writers twisted enough to write that stuff? Yeah, no, we, we found out-of-the-way playwrights. A lot of it was people out of New York, Chicago, uh, who were writing, you know, lunacy in the theater. We're working now on what could be a Mary Hartman for today, because the world has turned 180 degrees when you look around what you could be talking about today. And, uh, and we're looking in the same places for, uh, for writers out of the off, off, off Broadway theater, there, here, and elsewhere. And, and you know, an art group of writers. But this town and television has got, it's amazing how, you know, a young black writer who, who has written a play that you recognize as something so unusual coming out of his ethnicity and his part of the country and his uh, family background spend six months here and is writing a situation comedy, right? And it, it's, it's, it, it reads like any other New York uh, writer or Chicago writer. Or, you know, all of, the, all of the original juice is gone and there, it, he's been in the blender. Is it going to get better or wind up in a Cuisinart? I, I don't know. I, I can, because I don't see anything changing in the greater culture. Are writers going to have to continue with the violence and the sex in television? Well, I'm, I'm fortunate not to have to do it. Yeah. You know, we're talking about a great uh, writing community uh, where people are, are, are basically suppliers to a demand. And uh, it's very hard to, I've had this discussion any number of times, very hard to fault the writing community for so much of this when they are simply raising families and supplying a demand that exists from the people who are condemning them, yeah. you know, the advertisers. How about yourself? Do you draw on your own imagination when you write, or are you simply a sharp observer of life? Well, I don't know how sharp it is. I am a sharp observer of life to the extent that I'm, uh, to the extent that I'm sharp at all. But, you know, I, I admire too many writers, uh, and, uh, and I'm in such awe of their sharpness of observation, you know, in literature and, uh, and film directors and writers, you know. Uh, I, it's very hard for me to even consider myself in the league with, with, with some people who, who just amaze me with what they see. I think the best thing you can, you can say to a writer is, is go with your gut. What about the new writers breaking in? Boy, it's hard. It's hard. I, it, this is what I find myself telling uh, writers in, in, my, in my office. Nobody ever gave uh, better advice to a writer than to write, that in the first instance. Don't talk about it. Write. Uh, if you like some show that you think you ought to be doing, you could be doing, write that show. You know, write a script that you think is wonderful. And then 
get that script read. Now, that's easier said than done, but I like to think that what happens in my office can ha happens in any office. So I'm always saying to writers, you've got to risk being a pest. You've got to risk being a pain in the ass. You've got to come back. If you want Mr. Lear to read it, there's somebody at some desk in his place that you may, may take five visits before you catch somebody in the right mood or they, they've liked you, they, 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 they admire your perseverance, and they're going to say, uh, Norman, read this. Or Norman, ask somebody to read this. This kid's been in here several times. He's, he really... S I don't know of another way. Well, there's supposed to be another way. What about getting an agent? I wouldn't worry about the agent. I'd, get, I'd worry about getting read because most of the agents don't get you read anyway. Or, or getting the right agent is like getting the, the right producer to read it. Will you read over the transom material not submitted by an agent? We do all the time. The 64,000, maybe in your case, the $64 million question is, where do you get your ideas? The ideas come from the ether anyway. You know, uh, Emerson said, we lie in the lap of an immense intelligence and we are merely receptors to its beams. I believe that with all my heart. I don't know how else to explain uh, going to bed with a second act problem and waking up with the solution. The ideas come from from out here. We're not responsible for those. We, what we have to do is be open for them. What advice do you have for a young writer just beginning, besides go to sleep and wake up with an idea? If I were giving advice to a young person today, I would say stick with what that voice tells you. Stick with what the voice tells you, the conscience tells you. If the minute you start to use somebody else's research or the result of other focus groups or what the industry are doing, you're losing a piece of yourself. And I think what each of us brings or can bring to the industry, in, in, most precious of all, is oneself. Thank you, Norman, for yourself. And especially thank you for letting me grow up in a television family that was real. There were times <laughs> when I bit off more than I could chew, but through it all. Anybody discuss the the way you can uh, what what can I call it grace under fire? Well, well, no, that that hasn't come up. I do recall something like that having been said about Jack Kennedy, but no, not about me. You are perfect. I mean, you are you are a husband, a father, a, a you are to me everything. Be a and I thank you, Arthur. I I bless you for those words. I thank you. I know how much they come from a full heart, and, and I thank you so much. Thank you, darling, thank you. That was, that was my dear friend, Beatrice Arthur. I must say, in, in conclusion, that I've always, always considered myself a, a modest and unassuming man, and to have all of that affirmed in this incredible way by all of the wonderful people that I've taught to. <laughs> Yes, there were times. <laughs>